the book that is going to be sold out today. <laughs> so we're going to display it here so you can see what you'll be purchasing when this is done. And so now this will be done. Okay. Um, what we've agreed is that it will be a conversation. Is everybody here? Yeah. Uh, it'll be a conversation because um, I think it's important for us to exchange and have a dialogue because we all bring information, we all bring stories, we all bring knowledge, right, from our different perspectives, from our different experiences, and that's what makes our experiences, African descendants, so powerful because we all come from different places, we all have had different experiences. Those of us of a certain age have had certain experiences and young bloods now are having other experiences. So that all of that information becomes part of the knowledge base that we should share. And the importance of sharing it is because we hope that, you know, we have young people in the audience, that that will become part of their knowledge base and as they move forward begin to formulate how they live their lives as African descendants going forward. Um, what I'd like to address is uh, the genesis of the book, how the book came into being, and all of us as participants in the book will, uh, you know, uh, bring uh, particular perspectives in sort of developing the book. Uh, the Caribbean Cultural Center African Diaspora Institute, which is now 37 years old, I'm the founder and president. Uh, I started when I was two. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> annually does a Women of Power conference. And we're not talking of power in terms of precision. We're talking power in terms of spirit, power in terms of soul, power in terms of women, uh, uh, female energy, right? Uh, being that energy that contains and, 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 and brings creation and also is that power that um, we see in water, we see in the lake, we see uh, it flow through our veins and so on. So that we felt it important to have conversation, intergenerational conversations um, with each other so that information keep, continues to flow. And about, I would say, eight years now, eight years ago, we did a panel with some incredible women. Uh, Dorotea Wilson from Nicaragua, este, Seija Galvan from Santo Domingo, Marta Pro Santana from uh, Peru, uh, but I'm forgetting the others, Zulia uh, Mena from Colombia, and others. And the stories that came out were very interesting because a young woman in the audience, we had this panel at Hunter College. Um, you know, everybody was saying, I do this work, I do that work, I do this work, this is what I do with my community, and so on and so forth. And then this young woman from Santo Domingo, uh, Dominican, gets up and she says, you know what I want to know? I want to know what it costs you to do this work. And everybody froze. They said, you know, what do you mean? She says, I know how valuable your work is, but what does it mean in terms of your health? What does it mean in terms of your family? What does it mean in terms of your relationship? What does it mean? Everyone got very silent on the panel. And then all of a sudden, and I have known these women, most of them for about 10 years before the panel, and had organized with them, stories started coming out that I didn't know. Two women on the panel, Celia and Dorotea, said we were not but we realized that prayer wasn't helping our communities. Prayer is good, but that was not enough. So both of them stopped their pathway of being none and uh, became activists and builders of organizations. Uh, Marta Pro Santana talked about how her husband was killed for his beliefs. And she felt that she needed to continue this work as an activist in Peru. And each person gave very personal stories that we didn't know of each other. And that's the genesis of the book. We said it's very important for young people coming out for our own women to have voice in terms of what it costs to do this work. Women activists, what does it cost us to do this work? What does it cost our families? You know, my sons are now in their 30s, in the late 30s, and they're like, we don't remember going to the playground. And I said, I remember taking you once. <laughs> you know, at least once I took you. you know, I remember 
giving them flyers, you know. And it, it's funny, you know, but it it's real, it's true. You know, um, some of their life was impacted, and I hope positively, but also, you know, they were part of activities that stopped them from being children with their friends. And uh, we wanted to share those experiences. And what was very interesting was that most of the women didn't want to write. <laughs> and for us, and, and, I'll, and with that, is that that became very interesting to us. Because here you have these women who are powerful, transforming issues in their own communities, international travelers, uh, organizing locally, nationally, internationally. And when we ask, tell us your story, they got shy. They got totally, totally shy. And we couldn't understand it. And uh, that became a whole process in producing the book. But before I continue, I want to uh, acknowledge the presence of one of our foremost writers, because I don't consider myself a writer. Sandra Esteves is in the audience. So I want you all to know Sandra Esteves. And another book is Sandra. Sandra is part of it. Sandra <laughs> uh, must be part of it. So when we decided that um, we wanted to do this book, I also understood that being of a certain age, we needed, I needed to include young women in formulating the book and, and seeing the book to uh, its conclusion with me. So I'd like to introduce you to Marini Alva and Yvette Mondestin, who are the co-editors of the book. To our right, we actually have three of our contributors who are very blessed to have participated in this project. Ms. Lorelai Williams, a Harlem native who is a Jamaica, and Anita South, okay, but who has done extensive work across Brazil and really in terms of a lot of her work frames, what it looks like to, to construct things that engender solidarity and create connections across national borders. And it was very important for us to have, include her in this book because across Latin America we often see, across the diaspora we see the, the kind of cross pollination that happens in terms of social political thought and how social movements are born and um, and Lord I was very much impacted by her work in Brazil and sort of the power and the, even the cultural consciousness um, that she was blessed to find in, in her time in Brazil. It reframed blackness for her in a new way. And so we thought it would be important to have an African-American, Afro-Caribbean writer writing from that perspective of what solidarity looks like when you flip it, not just sort of the Americas being nourished by the North to South relationship, um, but what, what it looks like when the South nourishes the North. And so her voice was very important for us. Um, immediately to her left, we have Monica Carrillo, who was, we, we met many, many moons ago <laughs> in other lands, in South Africa. Um, and Monica and I were blessed. We, I was the coordinator for the youth delegation of Afro-Latino youth that went to the World Card, the United Nations World Conference Against Racism, Xenophobia, and other forms of discrimination. And so we were blessed to share the time and space there. And she's a poet from Peru. And we felt it was very important to have her voice because of her work on the ground, but also because as a writer, she brought a completely different nuance to the work, and she didn't have any trouble writing for this anthology. <laughs> <laughs> and immediately to her left, we have Evelyn Loren Ferro, who will be of Venezuela and IT, and then who comes later to Philadelphia, and then New York. So she's she's traveled the world, and Evelyn's voice was very important for us to not only have not only for the importance of including a South American voice. But a South American voice with another unique feature, which is being a Haitian descendant in Venezuela and also having the experience of being an Afro-Latina in the United States. So we felt that her perspective was very, very layered um, and very critical to what we were trying to highlight. So please welcome them all. Thank you. Thank you. You can talk about yourself. <laughs> no. Talk about yourself. Um, I can talk about myself. I guess what Marta left off was the process of the book, um, and that was, you know, one of the important, I think, lessons that we learned in trying to give birth to this book was how 
important a tool writing is in healing. Mm -hmm. um, because my thought, you know, Martha said a lot of the women were very reluctant, they were very shy. But what we found when we dug more deeply was that the women were not shy, but they were actually struggling to kind of to be vulnerable in a public space around what Martha mentioned, which was the, the person, the very personal and intimate cost of sacrificing for your community. Um, and also there was, I think, as as women, we often kind of, in Spanish, we say despreciar, right? We undervalue our experiences as women and what the importance is. And so the things that we give, we don't, we, we know that they're valuable to us, but we don't necessarily understand their value or the currency that they are in the world. Mm -hmm. And so for a lot of the women, you know, it was really like pulling teeth. Mm -hmm. Notice how she didn't describe her work. <laughs> <laughs> this is exactly what we found. I get to my work. I wrote my essay on time, though. So. No, but um, I think, you know, for all of us, it was, I mean, I think we want to talk about the process of giving birth to this, right? It was, we, we all struggled, including myself. I wrote my essay like a week before the deadline. <laughs> um, we all struggled to really, to say, to stand up and say with confidence that our personal experiences were important to the big picture. And I think that that was a really invaluable lesson um, because our personal experiences are the big picture, mm -hmm. right? They're, they're pieces of the big picture. And so personally, what I do, what I have done, and how I came to this work is um, I'm Puerto Rican and Panamanian descent, and my experience is, is kind of, I have like two passions and two pathways in life, which is working with youth in education, equity, and community development, and then as a cultural worker. Um, so I've worked for the last 15 years. I actually started working at the Caribbean Cultural Center as an intern many, many moons ago. Um, but later, really, like that, that, that work and that experience connected me to a broader community of artists, you know, both in performance and on the page, that I was very fortunate to, to build familyhood with, you know, my, my tribe, if you will. Um, and why this, this book was important for me personally was really that I think, you know, we talk about, when we talk about Afro Latinidad, it's very easy when we connect it to the African diaspora. That conversation, Afro-Latinidad, in, in relationship to the diaspora is an is a easy and natural connection. Mm -hmm. When you're born in the United States, someone that looks like me is very easily included in the Latino category, right? And then that experience of walking in the world that way, if you allow it to, will very easily allow you to erase everything else that you are. Because Latino is in, is in a racial category, it's an ethnic category, mm -hmm. right? It's a geographic designation. And what that means for every <coughs> Latino or, or Latin American person in Latin America or in the United States is different for every one of us. Um, and when you come, you know, one of the things, Marta, in, in one of the couple years ago, one of the redefining African American panels, we had this intergenerational, there was this intergenerational tension that was happening because folks on the panel from the Caribbean specifically were saying, well, I'm mixed race, I'm Afro Chinese, and I'm this, and I'm that, and I'm mixed with whatever we're mixed with, right? And in the African American experience, you can be mixed with a lot of things, but you're still black, right? In the Latin American paradigm, well, we, we stick to the, you know, 500 plus designations for whatever our mixture is, right? Mm -hmm. But we're never black, <laughs> right? Unless you, you, unless you just can't fight it. Unless you're phenotypically, <laughs> evidently, quote unquote, black, right? So for me, it was really important because I, I was raised in a household that is absolutely, quote unquote, mixed on both sides, right? My, I have an indigenous grandfather or European grandmother, quote unquote, mulatto <laughs> grandparents. Um, but I was always raised with a consciousness about the importance of affirming and celebrating my racial and cultural identity. I was also raised in a household where African religion was central to our, our family identity. And so for me, one of the important reasons or the significance of contributing to this anthology and helping to give birth to this anthology was ensuring that all of the many dynamic, I think, and complex <laughs> facets of Latinidad that were represented. So the people that look like me who are of African descent can say they're of African descent and celebrate that and not negate it because they can maybe pass for something else to keep it real. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And so, yeah, that's, that's that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not talk about myself enough. <laughs> 
What I want to say though as an editor though is that one of the joys for me was really being able to pull in younger voices like Lorelai who's been my sister since we were 10 years old and Ana Lara from the Dominican Republic who isn't with us who's actually in the Dominican Republic right now doing some work on the ground. Um, the intergenerational dialogue was really invaluable as we gave birth to this work we found that there were so many there were so many reasons why people had to write their story down. Um, and it, it took a lot of hard work and pressure and phone calls and logistically it was very, very challenging to produce this work. We completed the editing of this book probably seven years ago and it was only released last year. Right? And so this book itself has been it's been through many, many journeys, as have all of the women in the book. We found that, you know, as women were writing their stories, they were confronting cancer, they were confronting loss of loved ones, they were confronting, you know, um, personal threats, you know, threats to their mm -hmm. physical person, and all of the many things that Martha discussed, and so, and they still managed to be present on the page, and it was important to us because we have to document our stories, right? Otherwise, we cease to exist, right? We become invisible, and so I feel very blessed and grateful that with the contributions of all the women on the panel and all of the women that are not here physically with us today, that we were able to give birth to this book. So thank you for coming and thank welcome. You. So I'm Yvette Modestin. Um, and, and I do think the ancestors are, are smiling today. Actually, this is the first time that Marta Magnemes and I are doing something together about the book. Oh. So yeah. this is huge, uh, huge for us. Um, the process. A lot of work, and you know, I'm in Boston. I'm born and raised in Panama, uh, but I live in Boston. But before we start, you know, we don't get to do these open spaces often, and we don't get to think. Um, I am a product of a very strong knit family, and there's no move I make without my sister, and she's here. Uh, so uh, I, um, and I have my niece and my nephew who are here who. Um, if anyone has read anything that I write about, they are very two key people in a lot of my writing. Um, so I'm born and raised in Panama. Uh, very proud of that. <laughs> uh, but more proud of the fact that I'm born and raised in Colón, uh, which is the second largest uh, province in Panama, which is the largest populated uh, people of African descent. Um, so I take great pride in that. This book, you know, as Mari said, the timing and the process of it, and the length that it took to get out, uh, the time frame. But the fact is that in the process of it, like Mari was saying, is that some of the women were getting ill, we lost some of our sisters, and we lost someone that was very dear to me, uh, who the book is dedicated to. So I want to bring her into the space by calling out her name, which is Sonia Pia, um, which uh, died last year of a heart attack. Um, and Sonia, um, was a Dominican woman of Haitian descent who spoke against the treatment of Haitians in Santo Domingo. Mm. So when we were at that last point um, and they asked us about the dedication, oh. 